श्री गुरुभ्यो नम ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम ओम वक्रतुंड महाकाय सूर्यकोटि समाप्रभा निर्विघ्न कुरु मे देव सर्व कार्यु सर्वदा नमस्ते फ्रेंड्स आई हैव द यूनिक प्रिविलेज ऑफ स्ट्रैडलिंग टू वेरी डिफरेंट वर्ल्ड इन इंडिया दोज ऑफ पब्लिक पॉलिसी and indian knowledge systems and what i present today is informed by my learnings from experts and my experiences in both of these worlds given the brief time i have i will paint both of these vast domains public policy and indian knowledge systems with very broad brush strokes because my attempt will be to draw out a narrative thread connecting these two domains rather than exploring each one in depth so i will employ generalizations and abstractions in order to make an argument and the talk may get technical at times because of this of course generalizations and abstractions are problematic but i will not worry about this too much since what i am attempting to do is to take a step back and reflect deeply on public policy and what dharmic culture can offer to public policy so what i'm putting out is more of a vision rather than working out an elaborate synthesis and working out all the conceptual and practical details on the iks side i am grateful for all that i've learned from organizations like sangam talks brihat indica all of whom are working relentlessly to educate all of us about iks however i should maintain that the views expressed in this talk are personal and i do not speak for anyone but myself so what is the plan for the talk uh, today i will divide my talk into five sections so the first section is what is public policy so i will define public policy and then i will describe what is india's experience with public policy so that is section 1 of the talk section 2 of the talk i will say that public policy is in crisis today and i will explain how it is in crisis and why it is in crisis the third part of the talk will focus on the fundamental problem which public policy faces today and that fundamental problem is that public policy is culture blind it does not appreciate culture then the fourth part of the talk i will argue for why culture is needed in public policy what culture has to offer to public policy and then fifth part of the talk will be what can dharmic culture in particular offer to public policy making in india so five parts what is public policy why public policy is in crisis the fundamental problem that public policy is culture blind why is culture needed and what can dharmic culture offer to public policy in india so first what is public policy so public policy is any activity undertaken by the executive branch of the state by which i mean elected representatives and bureaucrats for public welfare that is what public policy is any activity undertaken by the executive branch of the state for public welfare by state i mean representative democracies where citizens elect representatives who then legislate law and craft policy that is what i mean by state and by public welfare i mean mostly economic well being and economic well being automatically folds in goals like public safety public security public health certain levels of educational attainment etc now it is important to understand that economic well being is valued exclusively in monetary terms and we can ask why this is so and i will answer this question a little later in the talk and secondly it is also important to appreciate that economic well being is the overarching objective of public policy everywhere in representative democracies around the world so everywhere in representative democracies around the world public policy makers take economic well being as the overarching goal or objective of public policy and we can also ask why is this so and i will answer this question a little later in the talk 
So all of the above, all of what I've said so far applies to contemporary India because India is also a representative democracy. So in India, public policy is any activity undertaken by politicians and bureaucrats for public welfare. Public welfare is equated to economic well-being for the most part and economic well-being folds in other goals like public safety, public security, public health, certain levels of educational attainment, etc. Now, I want to very briefly sketch a picture of the history of public policy making in India since independence, since 1947. So in the first 30, and I will, this will be a very, very fast forward uh, uh, description of Indian public policy history. So in the first 30 years after independence, so roughly till about uh, 1990, uh, 1980 or so, uh, the primary goal of public policy in India was economic growth via industrialization and the alleviation of poverty. And the policy approach that the Indian state used in order to achieve these goals was a socialist planning approach meaning that the state played a significant role not just in setting these goals but also in achieving them through the control of various economic sectors as well as markets. So the state controlled the economy, the state controlled various economic sectors and the state also controlled the marketplace. And this is the socialist planning context in which public policy was conducted for the first 30-35 years of independence. Now. What begins to happen in the 1980s is that India begins to liberalize. The state begins to progressively take a step back from markets and from various economic sectors. And this process of liberalization, which begins in the 1980s, begins to intensify in the 1990s and 2000s. And today it is a norm. So this process of liberalization that begins in the 1980s, intensifies in the 1990s and 2000s and finally comes into its own during the 2010s. During this process, India's public policy landscape undergoes dramatic changes. Okay, I'm talking about the last 30 years or so. But the goals remain the same. The goal of public policy remains economic growth and poverty alleviation. Just that the actors have changed and much of the responsibility for achieving these goals has now been devolved to the private sector. So India has now moved away from a socialist planning context to a more market-based context and it is within the market-based context as some of these goals, these traditional goals of public policy are sought to be achieved, which are economic growth and poverty alleviation. Now, some uh, commentators, some analysts think that India has now entered an era of unfettered markets. But this would be a wrong assessment in my opinion. You see, India is not like the United States where the private sector dominates the state. Neither is India like China, where the state dominates the private sector. If you can think of these two aspects of any country, the public sector and the private sector, in the United States, it is fair to say that the private sector dominates the public sector. Whereas in China, it is fair to say that the public sector dominates the private sector. Both are capitalist economies, but they are very different forms of capitalism. India is neither like the US nor like China. So in India, uh, according to uh, me, what has been happening is that India is witnessing a kind of symbiotic relationship between the private and the public sectors. Once liberalization began to happen in the 1980s and 1990s, the state which earlier had a lot of economic power and which dominated the private sector began to cede some of that power to the private sector. Because once the economy liberalized, the private sector came to the forefront of economic activity. And so the state ceded some of that power which it earlier had over the private sector. It ceded some of that power to the private sector. But something important happened in the 2000s, culminating in the digital identity system of Aadhaar and what is called India Stack, which came into place in 2010. And I would argue that with the advent of India Stack, 
the state began to reclaim some of that power which it had relinquished to the private sector as a result of the liberalization that happened during the 1990s. So what we have today is a digital identity system called India Stack, which is literally powering more and more of the Indian economy with every passing year and this is state owned. But private sector actors are riding on top of India's stack to conduct business. And so India, I would argue, has this unique new configuration where the state and the private sector are working collaboratively and neither is allowed to dominate the other. And uh, the jury is still out on what this kind of new configuration should be called. It is a new kind of capitalism, but it is not the kind of capitalism that exists in the United States and it is also not the kind of capitalism that exists in China. So this is the brief history of public policy in India. We started as a socialist planning state, we are now liberalized, uh, but we, it is not fair to say that the private sector dominates the public sector. It is not fair to say that India has now entered an era of unfettered markets. So now I will try to argue that public policy is in crisis, not just in India, but everywhere around the world, it is in crisis. And why do I say this? See, even after 70 years of public policy, poverty alleviation still remains a public policy goal in India. And we should ask why? Why has poverty persisted in India after 70 years of public policy making? Why has the rural urban divide remained so pronounced in India? Why is public health still a concern? Why are environmental pollution and education attainment still serious concerns for public policy makers after so many years of public policy? See, no doubt the current government at both the union and the state levels are doing a lot of work to address these problems. And I do not want to take anything away from that work. But it is the case that public policy in India and more generally public policy around the world and mostly that is a Western model of public policy because India has adopted the Western model of public policy for the last 70 years uh, and especially over the last 30 years. This model of public policy has not been a success anywhere in representative democracies. Think about the problems that this model of public policy has attempted to solve. This model of public policy has attempted to solve the problem of economic growth, the problem of increasing inequality, the problem of increasing environmental damage and climate change, the problem of uh, public health. All of these problems over the last 30 years have become more complex and more difficult to solve than they have ever been before. Okay? And one might even argue that some of these problems have progressively worsened with time. So this is why I am claiming that public policy is in crisis and more specifically the western model of public policy is in crisis. And if this crisis could be summed up in one way, one overarching uh, a contradiction, then that fundamental contradiction is that on the one side, public policy is trying to promote economic growth at compounded rates. And on the other side, it is hitting up against hard environmental and ecological limits. So economic growth at compounded rates cannot be sustained if ecological limits are to be respected. But why is economic growth at compounded rates necessary? It is necessary because much of the financing in representative democracies that powers economic growth is debt finance. And debt finance requires you to pay back more money than you received. So unless the economy is growing at compounded rates, you cannot finance economic growth through debt finance. So the pervasiveness of debt finance is what creates this fundamental contradiction between economic growth at compounded rates and ecological or environmental finitude, the finiteness of environmental resources, the finiteness of ecological resources.
and this contradiction deepens as time passes and public policy is really not addressing this fundamental contradiction. A particularly telling uh, example of this or statistic is that uh, among the 150 plus sustainable development goal targets which were adopted by the United Nations in 2015 with an achievement deadline of 2030, progress is stalled or reversed for 30% of these 150 plus metrics and progress is weak and insufficient for another 40% of these metrics, meaning that by 2030 we cannot hope any of these sustainable development goals to be comprehensively achieved. In fact, global leaders have already declared 2023 to be a moment of reckoning for sustainable development goals. So this is why I am saying that the current state of affairs is a crisis in public policy. The current in public policy is a moment of reckoning rather than a moment of celebration. But the Western world is celebrating minor successes here and there as if there is no problem. So the Western world is clearly in denial of the, uh, of the crisis that public policy faces today. And I would argue India also faces this crisis because India has in many ways imported a Western model of public policy for its own purposes. Now, there are other ways to characterize this crisis. One way to characterize this crisis is to say that there is no integrated framework in public policy today to think about the human condition and to think about its embeddedness in a natural world. There is no integrated framework. Secondly, there is a replication crisis. Policy insights from one context do not transpose easily into another context. So there is no appreciation of context in public policy, whether that context be historical context or sociological context or psychological context, public policy makers seem to not care about context largely. Yet another way of framing the crisis is to say that behavioral economics or nudge economics is more promise than reality. The, pro the problems that face public policy today require fundamental behavioral change, yet behavioral economics cannot induce fundamental behavioral change. After all, if all it takes is a nudge, then, then clearly behavioral economics is not inducing deep fundamental behavioral change. So more on this later. Now. What I will do in my diagnosis is that I will diagnose the problem at a slightly deeper level and I will show that there are three fundamental critical weaknesses that public policy must solve for. So the first fundamental weakness or critical weakness is that public policy is in crisis because the underlying model or the conceptual thinking proceeds from axiomatic assumptions that are clearly problematic, if not plain wrong. So public policy is grounded in a kind of theory that is just wrong. So that's critical weakness number one. Critical weakness number two is that the practical implications of using this kind of wrong theoretical model uh, is that economists and public policy makers commit five different kinds of mistakes, five different what I will call five conflations. They mistake the particular for the universal. They mistake explanatory power for predictive power. They mistake rhetorical discourse for representational language. They mistake monetary value for actual value and they mistake economics for ethics. So these are the five mistakes that economists and public policy makers make because of this wrong conceptual thinking that is underlying all of public policy making. So as a second critical mis uh, weakness. The third critical weakness is that public policy is culture blind. And culture is how human beings create meaning for themselves. Culture is the process of meaning making. We create meaning for ourselves through culture. And this is missing in public policy. At the core of public policy, culture is absent. 
and so there exists a gaping hole in the contemporary public policy discourse so now i will take each of these three critical weaknesses and describe them in a little more detail so the first critical weakness is that we are using the wrong model the underlying model itself is wrong where does this model come from so originally it comes from the rational enlightenment and what does the rational enlightenment say it says that the individual is supreme and the individual must subdue an unruly nature through the exercise of rational deliberation and action. Through the exercise of reason, the individual has to bring an unruly nature under their control and make nature an instrument or a tool for achieving human ends. And secondly, the rational enlightenment says that truth is achieved through a consensus of rationally deliberating individuals. No one person has access to the truth. Truth can only be accessed when a multiplicity of individuals come together and agree that something is true. So, of course, the rational enlightenment has a lot of other propositions and principles. I am just uh, uh, I am just articulating these two because these two are the fundamental building blocks of modern economic theory. And modern economic theory is rooted in three kinds of axiomatic truths or self-evident truths. One is that the fundamental unit of analysis for modern economic theory is the individual. So, there is a methodological individualism at the core of economic theory and the idea here is that in order to understand economic reality, it is sufficient to understand how an individual makes choices. And if we want to understand the behavior of the collective or the aggregate, then also it is sufficient to understand the, uh, how an individual makes choices and then simply treat the collective or the aggregate as a sum, as a mathematical sum of individuals. Okay, this is exactly how physicists do physics. If they want to understand the behavior of a molecule, then they first try to understand the behavior of the atom and then they just integrate across atoms. In other words, the whole is never more than the sum of its parts. And this is uh, one of the fundamental self-evident axioms of economic theory, methodological individualism. The second one is that the individual is only ever allowed to be rational. Rationality is the single positively stated normative orientation for individuals. And what does it mean to be rational? It means that an individual must first identify ends or goals and then must choose the means that are most efficient in achieving those goals. The least path, the least cost path or the least resistance path to achieving those ends. That is the axiom of rationality. The third axiom is, uh, or, or the th uh, methodological approach is one of empiricism. And empiricism says that we will allow only those concepts in our theory, in our models, which have observable or measurable, which represent observable or measurable phenomena in the material world. So, if there is something that is influencing human behavior that is non-material, it cannot be included in the model. Because it is not an empirical phenomenon. So, for example, we know that human beings are influenced or inspired by the subconscious mind or the unconscious mind. However, economists do not have the ability of conceptualizing the unconscious or the subconscious simply because it cannot be measured and it cannot be observed. Okay, so this is the axiom of empiricism. So three axioms, individualism, rationality and empiricism. Now, these axioms are basically drawing inspiration from the natural science disciplines, from physics, from chemistry, from biology. The earliest economists in the 18th century were actually moral philosophers. Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, these were moral philosophers. But what happens in the 19th century and then the 20th century is that economics begins to derive more and more inspiration from the natural sciences and from physics and from the engineering disciplines.
So economists in the 19th and 20th century begin to take more and more of an engineering turn. And economic theory begins to be developed as if the reality that that theory is attempting to explain is like physical reality. Economics becomes a science of social engineering as if social reality can be engineered in a machine-like manner. The, economic, the economy comes to be seen as a machine-like totality as if a lever pulled here in one part of the machine could be calculated to deliver a probabilistic outcome there in another part of the machine. This is the vision of economics that emerges in the 19th and 20th centuries. And by the way, this is also the vision that is carried over into public policy because it is the economists who are primarily driving the formulation of public policy. Now, as this is beginning to happen in the 19th and 20th century, the other social sciences like sociology, anthropology, psychology, they start complaining, they, they start crying foul. But economics doesn't care because economists believe that they are discovering using their method natural laws by which society is operating. So this conceit, this hubris that we are discovering natural laws by which society is operating, this conceit prevents economists from listening to the complaints from the other social sciences, which are saying that this is not how humans behave. This is not what inspires humans or influences humans. Economists don't care. So. All of this development and sophistication, however, in economics that has happened since the 19th century all the way to the present date, hides a fundamental paradox at the core of economic theory. And what is that paradox? The paradox which is at the core of economic theory is, is that economic theory aims to discover laws by which a sovereign individual actor behaves. Now, why is this a paradox? It's a paradox because on the one side, you're saying that the actor is sovereign. And on the other side, you're saying that the actor conforms to laws. Both of those things cannot be true at the same time. A sovereign actor does not act according to laws. So, how is this paradox resolved? Now, economics is a very interesting way of resolving this paradox. The way it resolves this paradox is that it says that the individual is sovereign, is behaving in a law-like manner because the individual maximizes something called a utility function. The individual maximizes utility. But the individual is sovereign because the economist does not decide what goes inside the utility function. So this manner of resolving the paradox, I would argue, is counterfeit. It's wrong. But anyway, this is how the paradox is resolved. But understand what it means when you resolve the paradox in this way. What it means is that the ends of economic activity become random. They become exogenous. And there is no proper discussion about the ends of economic activity. So this is the first critical weakness that we are working with the wrong model of human behavior. The second critical weakness is that this the practical implications of working with this wrong model of human behavior are five different mistakes, five different conflations. The first mistake is that economists and public policy makers mistake the particular for the universal, which means that they take empirical learnings from one context and they believe that these empirical learnings will apply in some other context. In other words, they treat context as being irrelevant. Context is not relevant. So that's the first mistake. The second mistake is that they mistake explanatory power for predictive power. Now, what does this mean? See, economics is a narrative science. It explains historical phenomena, but it cannot predict future phenomena reliably. In the social realm, see, there's an easy example by which I can help you understand this idea, that economics is a explanatory science, it is not a predictive science. See, if I were an astronomer, and if I could explain to you in the natural sciences, in the physical sciences, explanation and prediction are the same thing. If I can explain to you why the last lunar eclipse happened when it did, then that also means that I can predict to the second when the next lunar eclipse will happen. But 
if I can explain to you why the global financial crisis happened in 2008, that does not give me the predictive power to predict when the next global financial crisis will happen and what form it will take. This is the fundamental difference between the physical sciences and the social sciences. The fundamental difference means that when pronouncements are made by economists, the proper category for determining the value or the truth quotient in those pronouncements is not predictive power, but what I will call divinatory power. And divination is understanding the relations between things. Before divination is forecasting, it is understanding the relation between things. And what I am arguing is that for social reality, divination is the important category not prediction. And so one way to put this is to say that if Jyotish is pseudoscience, then economic forecasting is pseudo-divination. It is not proper divination. But that is what it pretends to be. The third conflation or the third mistake that happens is that economists and policymakers mistake rhetorical discourse for representational language. See, economics, again, is not a natural science like physics. Physics, the language of physics describes a reality that exists independently of human action. If human beings were to leave this planet, the laws of physics would still continue to apply. Newton's three laws of motion would still continue to apply. In fact, those laws would have applied even if Newton had not discovered those laws. The language of economics is not like that. The language of economics is not describing a reality that exists independently of human action. The language of economics is describing a reality in which humans are acting and participating. So this means that the speech acts of economists are not unlike the speech act of a judge who says, I now pronounce you guilty. Or that of a Catholic priest who says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. The language of economics has that kind of a flavor to it, okay? It is generative, it is creative. Economic sociologists have studied this aspect of economic language and they say that the language of economics is illocutionary or rhetorical or performative. It is not pure rhetoric, but it has a significant rhetorical component that is not acknowledged by economists and this happens to the detriment of public policy pronouncements because public policy pronouncements end up being end up wishing for an impossible world that cannot exist much of public policy making is idealistic the fourth mistake that economists and public policy makers make is that they mistake monetary value for social value now what does this mean this means that money becomes the value of all values if something cannot be translated into monetary value, it has no value. This is the understanding of economists and of public policy makers. Now, the real reason why monetary value becomes mistaken for actual value is because of the paradox and how that paradox was resolved. Recall that I just said that there was a paradox and the paradox is that economic theory claims to discover the laws by which a sovereign actor behaves and there is a paradox in this claim and the way that this paradox is resolved is that economists say that the individual must maximize the utility function but does not pin down what goes inside the utility function and the reason that monetary value is mistaken for actual value is because of the nature of that resolution. So what is happening here is that Something cannot be said to have value if it cannot be translated into monetary value. So again, I'll use a simple example to explain this point. Suppose I wanted to buy a washing machine and I walk into an electronics goods store and I know nothing about washing machines, but I know that I want a washing machine which has a lot of technical capabilities. What might be one way in which I could identify a washing machine for my use? I would look at the sticker prices and if I found a very expensive washing machine, I could infer from that high price that this washing machine must have all of the technical specifications I need, even without me knowing anything about those technical specifications. So notice here what is happening that the money price is communicating 
a certain aspect of value to me. This is fine. It is fine in the case of washing machines or in the case of TVs or in the case of mobile phones. But it is a slippery slope because what has happened is that this idea of value has now become commonplace for all things, not just for washing machines and phones and uh, TVs. Here's an example. Suppose I wanted to know what is the most important valuable question in theoretical physics today. One way to adjudicate this question is to bring theoretical physicists around a table and have them have a debate and discussion ki what is the most important question in theoretical physics today. But what are the chances of getting consensus in that room? Very small. It is unlikely that if you put 15 theoretical physicists around a table and ask them to arrive at a consensus that this is the most valuable or this is the most important question in theoretical physics, it's unlikely that they will arrive at a consensus. So what is the more easy way to answer this question? Well, one way to answer this question would be if I went to the National Science Foundation's website, the National Science Foundation is the government organization in the United States that makes research grants. To academics. One way to answer this question is to go to the National Science Foundation and to see which is the theoretical physics research project for which they have given the maximum grant. And to then infer from that that oh this must be the most important research question in theoretical physics. You see what has happened? What has happened is that I am inferring the value of that research project or that research question from the amount of money it has received from the National Science Foundation. In other words, money has become the value of values. Money is not merely a representation of some value that was pre-existing. It is itself the origin of that value. The fifth and final conflation that happens is that economists and public policy makers mistake economics for ethics. They mistake means for ends. Economics is not a science of ends, it is a science of means. Again, this problem arises because of the counterfeit resolution of the paradox. And the means, which is money, is elevated to an end in itself because money offers itself as an end via the several advantages that it possesses relative to the sacred. Its tangibility, its utility, its immediacy, its universality. In fact, some philosophers of religion have argued that in performing these functions, money has replaced God. Money has replaced the sacred. Since it is now money that demands our time, our care, our attention, our love and our devotion. And all of these things previously in pre-modern times were directed towards what we understand to be the sacred. So money has replaced the sacred. So five mistakes or five conflations. Mistaking explanatory power for predictive power. Mistaking monetary value for actual value. Mistaking economics for ethics. Yes. Um, mistaking rhetorical discourse for representational language. And mistaking the particular for the universal. Now, at this point you might say, but what about behavioral economics? Doesn't behavioral economics save economic theory? The answer is no, it doesn't. Because behavioral economics is not a positive theory of human behavior, which is what was needed. Behavioral economics is merely a catalog of departures from what was what is clearly a wrong theory of human behavior, which is the rational actor paradigm. And a negative list does not make for a positive theory. Behavioral economics is more wedded to the rational actor paradigm than behavioral economists would like to admit. Furthermore, behavioral economics misunderstands emotion. Behavioral economics models emotion as an interruption or a disruption or a corruption of rational decision making. Whereas the reason emotion binary is very stylized, it's contrived. I would argue that we cannot even think of something with reason if we are not emotionally invested in it. So reason and emotion cannot be separated so easily, cannot be made distinct so easily. So I would argue that behavioral economics does not in fact save economics. You could also say, what about the fundamental theorems of welfare economics? Now the fundamental theorems of welfare economics are two theorems for which two economists won a Nobel Prize. 
which are said to ground public policy theory. You know, um, we are told that public policy should only address those problems that arise from a failure of these theorems from obtaining in reality. Now, the problem is that the theorems are derived from an extremely stylized mathematical model. And in this model, there are an infinity of buyers and sellers. All actors are price takers and an equilibrium price vector emerges out of thin air. The model does not give a description of how this equilibrium price vector emerges. So what needs to happen is that a fictional or a fictitious Walrasian auctioneer, this is a technical term that economists use, a fictional Walrasian auctioneer has to be introduced from outside the model in order to close it, so that an explanation of how the equilibrium price vector is arrived at can be properly given. So what I've just said should be should communicate to you how contrived the whole model is itself. In reality, price is a verb, it is not a noun. And forms are price setters, they are not price takers. This means that this model, out of which the fundamental theorems of welfare economics emerge, cannot describe reality and it cannot even be brought closer to reality by some minor tweaks. It has to be abandoned altogether. And in fact, it does not offer proper guidance to public policy because it is so stylized that it is likely to fail in any kind of application to actual economic reality. So the idea that public policy should only uh, address those problems that arise from a failure of these theorems is meaningless. It is meaningless because these theorems will always fail. Finally, the third critical weakness in public <coughs> policy and in economic theory. Economics is culture blind and, th because, and therefore public policy is culture blind because economists cannot do math on culture. You cannot reduce culture easily to a set of measurable variables that would submit themselves to an engineering mindset. So economic theory is culture blind. Public policy is also culture blind. Now, what does this mean? Public policy does not, by being culture blind, public policy does not understand community. Public policy treats community as if it were a collective noun. Community is merely the aggregate of individuals. That is how public policy sees community. But the critical idea that you cannot have community without a ritual, this is lost to public policy makers and to economists. Similarly, public policy does not understand institutions. Public policy treats institutions as if they are constraints or rules or contracts. But institutions also embody, in reality, institutions also embody ethics. And ethics cannot be reduced to rules, constraints, and contracts. So, mostly what public policy ends up trying to do is it ends up creating a world in the image of economic theory, or rather wishing for a world in the image of economic theory, and getting frustrated because the world does not comply. The fundamental lesson from anthropology is ignored by public policy, which is what? The fundamental lesson from anthropology is that people do not behave rationally. They behave meaningfully. They do not behave rationally, they behave meaningfully. And culture is meaning making. The absence of culture in public policy deprives public policy of any meaning. So therefore, is it a wonder that public policy systematically fails? Or equivalently, public policy is systematically subject to the law of unintended consequences. Now, to say that public policy is culture blind is not to say that public policy is not influenced by culture. It is, but it is only influenced by fleeting and transient aspects of culture such as those derived from monetary exchange. Since culture is learned and transmitted through imitation and emulation, and money offers itself easily for circulation, monetary exchange becomes the bearer of value, of meaning, and of culture. Public policy, true, too, is driven by a concern for monetary exchange. It, so, so it ends up reflecting culture in a superficial, shallow, non-reflexive, unself-conscious manner. Okay. So how do we then fix these problems? How do we reintroduce meaning into public policy? I will argue that to reintroduce meaning into a public policy means introducing culture. Let culture and not money 
speak ethics. And this will ensure that only those aspects of culture that are deep, enduring, and have survived evolutionary selection and adaptation will should influence public policy, not fleeting and transient aspects of culture. And each of the five mistakes or each of the five conflations can be corrected by this move, by introducing culture. At the highest and deepest level, ends will be treated as distinct and independent of means. And this opens the space for a proper consideration of ethics. What I'm arguing is that without culture, you cannot have ethics. And you need ethics in public policy. Now, the important question arises that who is qualified to speak ethically? The average person is not qualified to speak ethically. Who is qualified to speak ethically? Okay, now this is where I will now introduce dharmic culture. Because dharmic culture answers this question. Who is qualified to speak ethically? Dharmic culture gives an answer to this question. See, rational enlightenment does not give an answer to this question. Rational enlightenment says that ethics is decided by a consensus of deliberating individuals or rather truth is decided by a consensus of deliberating individuals dharmic culture i will summarize dharmic dharmic culture is a vast set of things i will summarize dharmic culture in terms of five statements first there is multiple life metaphysics people have multiple lives and through multiple lives, the human subject represents the capacity for divine life. And that is freedom or liberation from karma. Moksha, in other words. That's a fundamental principle of dharma. The second principle of dharma is that the highest form of help a human being can receive is one that enables that human being to achieve that condition of freedom or to achieve moksha. The third principle is that the Guru, as embodied divinity, is indispensable for achieving the condition of freedom. The Guru is that form of, that highest form of help. And the Guru is also the call to discipline and effort in surrendering to the divine. The fourth principle is that embodied knowledge is the ultimate. It is self-authenticating and self-legitimating. What do I mean by embodied knowledge? I mean knowledge of the truth. I mean what we in Sanskrit we call jnana, what the Greeks used to call gnosis, which is knowledge of truth. And this is not knowledge that can be codified, it cannot be disembodied, it exists within the person who has experienced the truth, experiential knowledge, embodied knowledge, knowledge that cannot be disembodied, it cannot be codified, it cannot be put into a textbook or a manual in simple representational language. That is the nature of scientific truth, by the way. Scientific truth is disembodied knowledge, meaning it can be disembodied. It can be put into a manual, it can be put into a textbook. But yogic knowledge, the knowledge of jnana, is embodied knowledge and is embodied in the guru. And that knowledge is the ultimate knowledge. And it is self-authenticating, it is self-legitimating. It does not require any empirical evidence. Okay, so it's completely different from scientific knowledge. That's the fourth principle of dharma. The fifth principle of dharma is that the human condition is shot through and through with contingency. The working of karma also admits contingency. What is contingency? Contingency is radical uncertainty. Okay, uh, our lives are filled with uncertainty. Some of this uncertainty we can describe in probabilistic terms. We can call it risk, but much of it is outside the domain of risk. It's just pure uncertainty. It's contingency. The gods, the rituals, the practices in dharmic culture activate and animate a human being's passage through life in the face of contingency. This is what our gods do for us. This is what our rituals and practices do for us. They help us navigate this domain of contingency. And so lived reality in dharmic culture is basically a politics and an ethics of contingency mediated by the sacred. The sacred is very important. Without the sacred, it is impossible to navigate this contingency. And think about why this is important for public policy, because this is important in the lives of the poor. 
religion is important for the poor the sacred is important for the poor because the poor their lives are full of contingency and if they believe they believe because it helps them to live lives in the face of this kind of contingency okay so now i have described dharmic culture five principles multiple lifetimes liberation from karma second principle the highest form of help you can receive is the help that will help you to achieve moksha third principle the guru is the person who will help you and the guru is embodied divinity embodied knowledge the fourth principle is that this embodied knowledge is considered to be the ultimate knowledge in dharma and that is the knowledge of truth the knowledge of what we call jnana and then the fourth principle which is lived reality is a politics and ethics of contingency mediated by the sacred so how can dharmic culture inform public policy we have discussed what public policy is we have discussed the history of public policy in india we have discussed why public policy is in crisis we have done a deep diagnosis of the three critical weaknesses of public policy we have shown that public policy needs culture and now we have defined what dharmic culture is so finally i describe what dharmic culture can offer to public policy in light of all of the critical weaknesses that current western models of public policy suffer from so the first thing that dharmic policy dharmic culture can uh, uh, offer to public policy is the ends of public policy there are well defined ends and well defined stages of life for each individual there are the four purusharthas dharma artha kama moksha and then there are four stages of life brahmacharya grihastha vanash vanashrama and sanyasa so dharmic culture lays out the ends it does not confuse money for ends it lays out well defined ends and well defined stages of life for each individual it also says that the individual is an integral part, part of the community and the individual is not allowed to leave the community in the first two stages of life the individual must participate in the community so there is a well defined idea of community and the role of the individual within that community i asked the question earlier who is qualified to speak ethically dharma dharmic culture has an answer to that question as well dharmic culture says that shabda or testimony is a valid method of knowing and whose shabda is a valid method of knowing the gurus the rishis the swamis because they have embodied knowledge they have jnana and that knowledge is self authenticating it is self legitimating dharmic culture also has well defined qualities or attributes for the policy maker to embody anybody who reads arthashastra can see that chanakya has laid out a series of qualities or attributes that the ideal policy maker should embody the cyclical aspect of time and therefore the idea of ordered repetition as a way of understanding and appreciating both the human subjects relationship to the natural world and also that subjects responsibility to that world these are absolutely critical contributions that dharmic culture can make to public policy let me repeat that cyclical aspect of time that there is a cyclical aspect of time there are various cycles there is the daily cycle there is the seasonal cycle there is the astronomical cycle both from the micro all the way to the macro there are cycles and dharmic culture respects these cycles understands that these cycles are themselves related and that understanding gives us an understanding of who the human being is and who the human being is in relation to the natural world and what the human being's responsibility to that natural world is so this makes for integrality and sustainability sustainability is is woven into the core of dharmic culture it doesn't have to be added on from the outside so dharmic culture is nothing called externalities which economic theory has so therefore i would say that dharma codifies guidance on all aspects of life and the world it gives us a value system it codifies phases and stages of life it codifies daily rhythms of the human and natural worlds 
it gives us guidance on education and pedagogy it gives us guidance on social institutions on jurisprudence on statecraft and political economy etc 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 at an abstract level dharmic culture delivers us from binaries freedom from binaries is secured because both this and not this and neither this nor not this are admissible as logical possibilities this is nagarjuna's famous tetralemma which is that a statement can be both true and false and a statement can be neither true nor false these two additional logical possibilities that are available in dharmic culture create some much greater space for conceptual possibilities and logical possibilities within public policy all aspects of thinking abstract pragmatic analytic synthetic critical multiperspectival all aspects of thinking are honored and respected in dharmic culture no aspect of thinking is to, is set aside and finally creativity of the intellect is allowed to flourish and is sanctioned by the sacred so the sacred is at the top of the pyramid not money the sacred the sacred is at the top of the pyramid and the sacred sanctions all aspects of thinking and creativity of the intellect so finally some concluding thoughts so the question will come does this not threaten secularism so the answer to that question is that binaries such as religious and secular are western constructs and even in the west they are unstable and how do you know that even in the west this concept of secularism is an unstable concept just look at the dollar bill what do you find on the dollar bill you find on one side of the dollar bill an inscription it says in god we trust and you find on the other side of the dollar bill this pyramid with the all seeing eye of divinity at the top now ask yourself this question what is a theological inscription doing on a currency note that too a currency note issued by a government whose constitution insists on a separation of church and state remember that the american constitution insists on a separation of the church and the state and the dollar bill is issued by the state so what could be more secular than a dollar bill and yet on a dollar bill you have a religious inscription which says in god we trust and you have that pyramid with the all seeing eye of divinity so i would argue that even in the west secularism is an unstable concept okay secondly the question could come are not all religions same and equal answer is no all religions can may be equal but they are not the same sociologists of religion have uh, have assured us that the logic of religious commitment differs across religions and that these differences are consequential for downstream aspects of social reality this idea that all religions are same and equal is patently wrong they may be equal but they are not the same the world is caught up in a clash of civilizations what is the clash the clash is between secular bottom up democratic law making where people elect representatives and those representatives legislate law so that's a bottom up system of law making law making versus a religious top down theocratic system of law making where there is divine revelation that divine revelation is recorded in a book and that book dictates law so think of the united states and iran these are the two poles these are the two extremes in the spectrum on the one side you have democratic law making where people elect representatives and they legislate law on the other side you have a holy book called the quran and the quran dictates law top down top down versus bottom up this is the clash of civilizations dharmic culture favors neither the one nor the other our rishis our swamis and our gurus are the fount of an ethics and a law that are both human and divine at the same time dharmic society is authentically pluralistic and it admits authentic theological diversity and the evidence of its evolutionary adaptiveness is plain to see so the details need to be worked out the time is now and we must begin and that with that i will end my talk om shri gurubhyo namaha
ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नमः ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नमः ओम